to say glory. If you, I don't know which way to go. If, if, you, if, if you're ready for God's word, if you're ready for God's word, just high five your neighbor and then just grab a seat, grab a seat, grab a seat, grab a seat. I, I just about preached out of my voice in, in the first service because I'm going to be honest with you. I'm just excited about being in the Lord's house today. On, on, on Thursday last week when we were planning um, this weekend's experience, we were together, staff and all, and we were talking about this coming weekend and they were, you know, they were like, they just know that I'm like this weather geek, you know, and so I'm like, they're like, are we going to have church or not? I said, we having church. I mean, I don't care if it's like a foot of snow, we having church. And uh, I just, you know, I just was ready to just like be here with you people. You know what I'm saying? I was ready to hang. You ready to hang out in the Lord's house today? So here we are in week three of this series, this theme for our year build. Somebody say, I am a builder. Get your wristbands, man. We, we're passing out wristbands. If you haven't got your wristband yet, you need to get it because they're free. You know what I'm talking about? Free. Somebody say free. Free for free, 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 free. What company is that? That's just aggravating me. Free. Yes, yeah, an insurance company. All right, free. Well, you know insurance ain't free. But anyway, so, <clears throat> oh, it's taxes. Okay, well, see, somebody was wrong. It's taxes. You see how people lead you astray? Anyway, <clears throat> so, so, so here's the definition of build. The definition of build is to construct something by putting parts and materials together. Look at your neighbor and say, I am a builder. Look at your other neighbor and say, you're a builder. Well, what's the definition of, of a builder? The definition of a builder is the person who constructs something by putting parts and materials together. God has called us to be builders, to build the kingdom. And we learned last week, Nate, that our ability to build has everything to do with our ability to communicate. Our effectiveness as a builder depends on the effectiveness of our communication, how we communicate with him and how we communicate about him. How we communicate with him, meaning prayer, and how we communicate about him, meaning others. Now, I'm not talking about going out on every street corner and just shouting out Jesus and telling everybody about Jesus. I'm talking about something deeper than that. In other words, our lives should tell a story. What is the story of your life telling? What image is the story of your life painting? Because you have a responsibility as a Christ follower to not just tell your story, but your story should tell his story. Your story is connected to his story. So it's the story of your life telling God's story. Last week, the title of the message was Let's Talk About It. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, let's talk about it. I want to go a little bit deeper today. Can we do that? Because really today is not part three. It's part three on your notes, but it's not really part three, Richie. It's really part 2B. Why? Because last week in part 2A, I didn't finish up what God had in my spirit. And so today I want to go a little bit deeper and I want to use God's word to illustrate this. But I want to first give you the title of today's message. Are you ready for the title? Look at your neighbor and say, can't stop talking. Look at your other neighbor and say, you can't stop talking. And I, I need you to say it nice. Don't say, you can't stop talking. What's wrong with you? Say it nice. Say, can't stop talking. It, it's like MC Hammer. Can't touch this. Don't, 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 don't. So it's supposed to be, can't, can't stop talking. Don't, don't, don't. No, because I worked on that all week and y'all didn't laugh enough for me to do the dance. So I ain't doing the dance. You know what I'm saying? Somebody say, can't stop talking. Two weeks ago, we were in Acts chapter 3. Last week, we were in Acts chapter 4. Today, we're going to be in Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, verses 17 through 42. Are you with me? Acts chapter 5 is the evidence of faith for Peter and John. It's the evidence of their faith. Why is that? Because last week in Acts chapter 4, they were standing before the Sanhedrin, these religious leaders, and the Sanhedrin said to Peter and John, no longer communicate the name Jesus. 
And Peter said, we cannot help but to talk about what we've seen, what we've heard, and what we've experienced. That was chapter 4. So chapter 5 becomes the test. Will they keep talking about Jesus? Because this is the evidence of their faith. Or will the persecution cause them to stop talking about Jesus? So Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. I'm going to read the narrative, and then we're going to pause and do some work. But let me just say this. I got a lot to read, so you're going to have to be fast listeners today. Somebody say, I'm a fast listener. All right, here we go. We're going to pick it up. Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. I got to get there. Not John chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse 17, says this. Then the high priest and all of his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and they put them in, in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. And, and the angel said, go and stand in the temple courts and tell the people all about this new life. Hold on a second. I need you to grab the scene here. It says that the angel of the Lord broke them out of jail. Now, this shows us the humor of God because probably you, you didn't realize this, but some of the backstory is Sadducees do not believe in angels. And here God is using an angel to set the captive free just to prove who he is. Mm, good Lord have mercy. But, 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 but it says they're jealous. That the religious leaders are jealous. Do you know why they're jealous? Because the word that is coming out of the mouths of Peter and John and all of the other apostles, the narrative that they're talking about, is changing hearts in Jerusalem. And they're becoming offended. They're jealous because now they see all of these people coming to this new life. So they want to tear down what it is that Peter and John are building. Can I tell you something? I don't know who this is for. But when God begins to do something in and through you and he begins to build something in and through you, jealous people are going to come out of the woodworks. They're going to begin to tell you who you are not, what you cannot do, what you are already doing you can't really do, and you need to remember that you can't do it. And they're going to say and remind you that you cannot do it. But what I need to remind you of is that you've got to listen to the Holy Spirit because you cannot listen to them because they're so jealous they're going to begin to tear you down. So you've got to begin to protect your spirit and make sure you're not listening to the wrong they. Are you with me? you got to make sure you're not listening to the wrong. That You've got to guard your heart. You've got to guard your mind because God has placed a word within you that he wants to build on. And people that are around you will begin to be jealous of you. And they'll try to tear down what it is God is building in your life. Just be, let me just be honest with you. The, the truth is, how many of you know when God starts blessing you, have you ever seen other people get aggravated because the blessing God gave to you? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Like you're praying for something, you're like, God, I just need you to show up. And you see somebody else gets what you've been praying for, and you're like, uh-uh. Uh -uh. Let me tell you something. We need to guard our spirits, guard our hearts, because God is building something in you that the people around you may become jealous of, and they'll try to tear it down. Let's continue to move on. Somebody say amen. Verse 21, at daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, huh, we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing outside of the doors. But when we opened them up, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, look, the men that you put in jail are standing in the temple courts and they're teaching the people. <laughs> Verse 26, at that, the captain with his officers brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. Verse 27, the apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter looked and said to them, we must obey God rather than human beings. 
the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross, and God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. And we are witnesses of these things. We've seen it. We've heard it. We've experienced it. As so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to, who, to those who obey him. Again, reference to the Holy Spirit. You need to be careful as to who you're listening to. You've got to follow the direction of the Holy Spirit in your life. You've got to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit in your life. Because, listen, it's impossible for you to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit if you place a higher value on what someone else says rather than what he's saying. I need you to hear that today. I don't know who that's for. Let's go on and read. It says... When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all of the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered the men to be put outside for just a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin, men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Because some time ago, Thutis appeared claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied around him, and he was killed, and all of his followers dispersed, and it all came to nothing. Verse 37, after him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census to lead a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all of his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you to leave these men alone. Let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourself fighting against God. Holy moly. Three verses that I want to pay close attention to today. The first verse that I really want to focus on is verse 20. Verse 20, why? Because in chapter 4, verse 20, Peter and John were standing before the Sanhedrin and they said, when they told them no longer speak about the name of Jesus, Peter said, we can't help but to talk about what we've seen and heard. That was chapter 4, verse 20. Chapter 5, verse 20, God reiterates what they had spoken in chapter 4, verse 20, when he says, go into the temple and tell the people about the new life. Warren, what is the new life? The new life is what they had experienced in Jesus Christ, what they had seen, what they had heard, what they had experienced. But what is so beautiful about this is, and, and ironic, but yet full of symbolism, is that God broke them out of a prison in order for them to go and tell the story. God broke them out of a place of confinement in order for them to go tell a story about freedom. God broke them out of the physical confinement in order to give them symbolism to preach about the spiritual confinement that can be broken in Jesus Christ. In other words, the symbolism is don't focus on, and they probably did say we were broken out by an angel of the Lord, but don't focus on the physical thing. Focus on the sp spiritual journey, the spiritual freedom that God is giving. It's so beautiful here how God breaks them out of this physical confinement in order to prove that he's the God who will break you free spiritually. But think about this with me for a moment. This not only proves the faithfulness of God. How, how many of you know God is faithful? But it also proves that there's purpose in pain. Why? Because God did not break them free for their comfort. God broke them free in order for them to follow his command. Woo. In other words, go and tell. He, he set them free from prison so that they would follow his Command, go and tell people about this new life. So that's verse 20. Verse 29 is when Peter says, as for us, we, we have to obey God rather than man. That kind of speaks for itself. And then it's verse, it's verse um, 39 where Gamaliel says, um, he says, listen, if you're going to fight against these guys, you need to really stop because if you're fighting against God, you're not going to stop it. What is he saying? <laughs> what he's saying is, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. <laughs> What he's saying, if, if God is for me, then tell me who can be against me. <laughs> what he's saying is he's the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the, he's the creator of the universe. And if he's creating, you're not going to stop his creation ability. <laughs> but what else is he saying? Listen, when you read between the lines, you discover that what he's saying is God is writing the story. And if God is writing the story, you can't stop the story that he's writing. Some of you right now, let me just be honest with you, we're in the new year and you've got a resolution or you've got a personal 
value goal system, whatever it is you want to call it today. These, they've got all kind of new lingo for that. But whatever it is, and you're trying to find a book. You know, you're trying to find the book because you want the best life now. You want the most efficient, most productive life now. Can I tell you something? You don't need to have a book. You already got the book. Your story is in this book. <laughs> Your story is in this book. The story will define your life. Your story is in this book. God's story is in this book. God connects your story to his story in hopes that you will talk about his story. This is where your story is at. You don't need a book that tells you how to have your best life. You already have the book that will tell you how to have your best life now. And this is your story. Your story is in this book. And you need to grab this book and make sure that you apply it to your heart. So here's Peter and John. They get out of prison and they go right back to the temple gates or right inside the temple courts and they begin to preach this gospel. They begin to tell people about the goodness of who Jesus is, this new life. How, why, all of this persecution that's coming against them, but yet out of the overflow of their hearts, their mouths are speaking. Remember, they can't help but to talk about what they've seen, heard, and experienced. You remember the Bible says, out of the overflow of your heart, the mouth speaks. So what you were taking in is going to always come out of your mouth. And what they had been taking in was the goodness of God. So they couldn't help but to speak about what they had seen and heard. It's the overflow. What's overflowing out of your life? In fact, let me, let me just illustrate this. I used this illustration last week. I'm going to build on it this week. So, so I want the camera to kind of focus on this, this cup. How many of you tuned in last week online? You tuned in online last week. All right. All right. So you may have seen this. So just humor me because I, I want to take it one step further. You see, in life, in our Christian journey, if you will, God will place us in places. He will plant us in places in hopes that our faith will be so full and overflowing that it begins to change the geography around us. In other words, that we're so full in our faith that, that we just you know, can't help but to pour out who it is God is and what it is God has done and, and the new life that God has given us the same way Peter and John were doing. You know, he, he wants to fill us up. He'll place us somewhere. He'll place you in your neighborhood and he'll fill you up and He'll place you in your workplace and he'll fill you up. He'll place you with your family and he'll fill you up. And he'll place you in your neighborhood and he'll fill you up. And we all love to be full. We all, we all love to be full of, of, of God. How many of you know? We just we love to, the fullness of God, the blessings of God. How many, how many of you are with me? We just love it. We love it. We love it. We love it. We love to be full of God in our faith journey. We want to be full of, of, of God. Here's the deal. We, we all are satisfied when it comes to being full, but we're dissatisfied when it comes to the responsibility of overflow. Let that resonate with you. Hold on a second. We're all satisfied when it comes to being full, but we're dissatisfied when it comes to the responsibility of overflow. Why? Because overflow will cost you something. Overflow will cause you to get out of your comfort zone. Overflow is not for you. <laughs> Overflow is for those that are around you. Overflow is going to require you to do something for those that are around you when it's so much easier for us just to hold on to what it is God did for us. But that makes your faith about you. It would have been easy for Peter to have said, you know what, God, we're, now we're out of prison. John, you with me? Um, he broke, we're full. We're full of restoration. We're full of hope. We're full. We're full of breakthrough. But we ain't going back over there. We ain't doing it. That's going to cost us something. It's going to cost us a lot. Can I tell you something? Overflow is a choice. Overflow is a choice. We all want God to overflow in our lives, but when the, the water begins to overflow the cup, there becomes a responsibility on your part to do something with the overflow. Because the overflow is not for you. When your faith is full and there cannot be another drop placed within your cup, and you're not willing to have overflow in your life, you're really no good for the kingdom of God. 
Let me high five the Holy Spirit up here. Good God Almighty. Because your faith has become about you. <laughs> and here's Peter and John saying, we must obey God rather than man. We can't help but to talk about what we've seen and what we've heard and what we've experienced. So, so let me give you some context here for a minute because I, I need to build on this. They're, they're, how do Peter and John do this? Think with me for a moment. There, according to history, there are 11 people groups or people that are against these early Christ followers that are trying to squelch their voice. They're trying to tear down what it is Jesus built up in them. And they're trying to silence their voice. How do they do what they do with all of that persecution? And then last week when I was in this narrative of Scripture, God gave me this illustration. And I used this illustration last week. But today I want to build on this illustration. Uh, Johnny, come on up here, man. I used you in the first service. I'm going to use you again in the second service. Bring, bring your Bible, man. Bring your Bible. Bring your Bible. If you remember last week, and Johnny, I want you to come right here and stand right here, right here, right here. I gave this illustration last week. Let me see your Bible, Johnny. Everybody give it up for Johnny. My, our youngest son, uh, Jacob, his name is Jacob. I'm going to brag on him for a minute. Is that all right? How many of you know we should be bragging on our kids? Well, when he was in high school, he... Um, he was, a, he was an all-star athlete in several sports. I mean, an all-star athlete in several sports. His favorite sport and the, and the sport that he received most accolades in was football. He, he received county awards, all-conference awards, starting in his, his uh, sophomore year, uh, junior year, his senior year. He won awards in several different positions. He won all-region quarterback his senior year. He was one of the top quarterbacks. He was the top quarterback in our region. He was given a gift or, a, or, or an award by Drew Brees, who was the quarterback for the New Orleans Saints at that time. He was one of eight or so quarterbacks across two different states who were selected for regional awards. He was good. I'm just saying, he was real good. He got that from his dad. I'm just saying. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. So anyway, we hired him a quarterback coach, Johnny, because we knew that he needed some training. How many of you know if we're going to be good at what it is we're doing, we've got to train ourselves? The same is true in your spiritual journey. You got to train yourself. Okay, so we hired this quarterback coach, and this quarterback coach did this drill with him where he would get in the, the, the passing position, and, and he would take the ball, and he would put it up by his shoulder as if he's ready to pass the ball. Just go ahead and do that, Johnny. Just put it in that, that position, all right? And, and he would hold on to the ball, and, and, and the, the quarterback coach would begin to slap the ball, trying to knock the ball out of his hands while Jacob was continuing to look downfield at his field of vision. He was trying to distract him. He would hit him all over. He'd hit him in the ball. He'd hit him in the shoulder. He'd hit him in the back. He'd hit him in the helmet. He was trying to knock the ball out of his hands because if you don't protect the ball, you can't complete the pass. If you don't protect the ball and keep your head downfield, you won't be able to see the thing. You won't have the vision that you need in order to complete the pass. And, and so he was making sure that he protected the ball in every sense of the word. Okay. Then he threw another wrinkle in it. He went to another level. I, I, need, I need four volunteers. Just stand up in your seat and I'll, I'll point at you. Right here's one. Uh, 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 two, those two right there. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come right here. That's four. That's four right there. Come on. All four of you. Come on right here. Okay. Here's what he did next. After he would do this, Richie, I want you to stand right here. Right, right here, Richie. Oh, right. Okay, James, right here, right here, right here. Are you stand right there, right, right, right there, right there, right there. You stand right, right, right here, right in front of him. Okay, now what he did was he would bring in four or five guys that would pretend to be the defensive line. Their job was to distract him, to keep him, to keep Jacob, in this case, Johnny, from seeing downfield. And so what they would do is they would hit on him. I mean, they would hit on him. They'd punch on the ball. They'd hit him and slap him in the helmet. So come on, guys. They were a distraction. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about. And, and sometimes they would even have those pool noodles. And they would swing those pool noodles. And they would just be throwing their hands up in the air. You know, so they're waving them like they just don't care. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> And just to distract him so that he couldn't see downfield. They would try to get in his field of vision, too. Sometimes they'd swing around in front of him trying to get in his field of vision. So he couldn't see downfield. So he couldn't complete the pass. And then it hit me. P 
Peter and John are not protecting a football. They're protecting the word that God gave to them. And there are all kinds of people who are coming against them, trying to distract them from what it is that God is trying to build through them. <sighs> trying to, good God, somebody get with me. Trying to keep trying to keep them from being everything it is that God proclaimed over their lives, trying to keep them from passing off the word so that the kingdom of God will continue to grow. The distractions, hold on a second, and, and, and then it hit me, you know, the distractions. Sometimes the distractions are, are the Sadducees and, and, and the Pharisees and, and, and the religious seas and, and all of the other seas like complacency and stagnancy and social media see and, and your past see and your difficulty see and your lack of confidence see. Come on, somebody, listen, and, and, and your feelings of guilt and unworthiness and you can't see what it come on guys you're supposed to be a distraction somebody punch that big dude <laughs> and so you know what happens now listen to me really clear here so what happens we get into that situation to where the word that God has placed within us we're no longer building on because we're so distracted and we're so worn out and so instead what we do is we come to church and we want to treat the symptom by church attendance but you cannot just treat the symptom by church attendance you've got to treat the problem by protecting the word somebody say protect the word Somebody say, you can't stop talking about it. Somebody get around in front of him. There we go. You see, can I tell you something? If, 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 if you become so focused on the Seas, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, you won't be able to listen to the Holy Spirit leading you and guiding you. You won't, you won't be able to because you'll be more focused on what's coming uh, against you. And then pretty soon, you won't even be talking about the word that God gave you. You'll be talking about the Sadducee who's coming against you. And you'll be talking about him so much and about him so much and about him so much and about what he's doing and how he's doing it and why he's aggravating you and all this, this that, and the other, that pretty soon out of the overflow of your heart, the mouth speaks and you've forgotten what it is God told you to do because you're so busy worried about what it is he's trying to do. Y'all don't want to hear this today. And so you'll give in. You'll say it's not worth it. Somebody say you can't stop. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you're not holding on to the word and protecting the word, it's going to be easy to, 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 to take your eyes off of the downfield. And the next thing you know, you're spinning around, you're spinning around, you're spinning around, you're spinning around, you're spinning, and you're wondering why you're not in the overflow. When his quarterback coach was training him, he would put him in this position, but then he would also outline some cones. And he had to, he had to go through the cones in foot motion while these guys are slapping at him with pool noodles, and he couldn't look down at his feet. Oh, this is good. And then it hit me. What is the word of God? It is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I said it again. So here, how do they do this? So how does, how, does, how does Peter and John with this persecution, because listen, in our day and age, can I take some more time today? I know I'm over time. I really don't care today. I'm going to just be honest with you. We ain't been together in so long. I'm ready to just, woo, let it out. How does Peter and John do this? How, how do they do this? How? How, how do they stand up against this persecution? Well, John would later write in the book of Revelation, he, says, he tells us how. He says, we are overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. In other words, it's our ability to talk about what it is God has done that gives us the ability to overcome. 
In fact, John would write in 1 John chapter, chapter 1, verse 1, John would write this. Johnny sent me this last Sunday. He said, man, this is what God put on my heart during the sermon. And when I went back to read it, I thought, oh, wow. Hey, look what he writes. This is John. John and Peter are, are, are in this situation. Here's what John writes. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of God, everything they've seen, heard, and experienced. Next verse. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. Grab this. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. The fourth verse. We write this to make our joy complete. Hold on a second. This is so good. In other words, what, what, what John is saying is that when the right overflow is, is, is coming out of you, it gives you the ability to overcome. When the right, when, when everything that God has been doing and you just talk about him and you're communicating about him, it gives you the ability to, to overcome. Listen, you, you've got to grab this. You, you know that when there's a need in your life, when there is a need in your life, you'll do anything you can to break through that adversity in order to meet that need. Like if you're hungry, what you going to do? You're going to eat. So I wrote this thing down. I wrote this thing down. Look, here's what I wrote. It says, what if we lived in such a way that the need that motivated us was the need to build what God put in our hearts? What if we lived in such a way that the need that just absolutely was driving us every day was to build what it is God put in our hearts? What if we put a priority on the presence of God in our lives? What if we prioritize the presence of God in our lives? Can I tell you something? If you prioritize the presence of God in your life, you'll be proactive rather than reactive. We're so busy in life reacting to our problem rather than being proactive. If you prioritize the presence of God in your life, you know what else? It will change your preferences. You know why? Because if your faith is about you, that is a selfish faith. But when you prioritize the presence of God in your life, God gets all up in your faith. He ignites you, and you don't want to have a selfish faith. You want to have a selfless faith. And so when, when your faith is, is you're prioritizing the presence of God in your life, you, you, you'll want your faith to be, to, to be selfless. And, 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 but if, if, if it's not selfless and, and things are coming against you and it's about you, then you're, you're going to feel like it's not worth it. I, I, I'm going to stop this. I, I, just, I don't feel like dealing with this pain. Let me illustrate this for you. If your faith is more about what you want in your job, You'll believe your job is about you rather than the opportunity to overflow so that others are blessed. And when you believe your job is about you and the first time that a person comes to you and begins to come against what you think should be your promotion, guess what you're going to do? You're going to begin to show yourself. The overflow of your heart is going to be about you. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. So the overflow of your heart's going to be about you, and therefore you're going to be mad. So what you're going to do, you're going to start looking for a new job. But when you realize that your faith is about being selfless, you may get in a jam on the job, but you realize, hold on a second, this is just an opportunity. God gave me the job. This is just an opportunity to, for me to reflect the image of Christ in this job. You see the difference here? How, how did... How to, listen, think about this with me for a minute. Here is Peter and John. They come out of this prison and they go and they begin to preach this, this gospel. This, this is the same Peter. This is what I, I need to tell you. This is the same Peter who just a few weeks before denied knowing Christ. Why? Because his personal preference was comfort. But now, a few weeks later, he can't help but to preach about what he's seen and heard because his personal preference is no longer comfort. His personal preference is pointing to the comforter. Yeah. 
Good God Almighty. Woo! They'll catch that on the way home, James. Let me just go and give me some love right here. That's what I'm talking about. It, you, you, need, you need to grab this because these are people. Think about this with me for a moment. These are people who hurt Peter, but Peter still wants them to receive the love of Jesus Christ. Do you know what that tells me? That tells me that when we prioritize the presence of God in our lives, not only will he change our preferences, but he'll change our prejudices. Sure. That was good. We ought to just end right there and go on home and say, Woo, amen, that's right. Here's what I'm trying to say. Here's what I'm trying to say to you. When, when the overflow of your heart is right, it will begin to change the geography around you. It will change the geography around you. It will begin to impact the geography uh, around you. So many times we miss opportunities that might be over here because the distraction around us. That just throw your hands in the air and wave them like you just don't care. Okay, so we, we miss the opportunity that's over here. We miss the opportunity that's in our family. We miss the opportunity that's in the workplace. We miss the opportunity that's that, 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 you know, in our neighborhood with our kids, with, with our school. We miss it because all of this stuff, we're more focused on all of this stuff. Then Jacob's quarterback coach threw in another wrinkle. He threw all of that stuff around him. He's going through the cones now without looking at his feet. He's moving in full speed. You know, they're moving at full speed. They're hitting him in the helmet. They're hitting him with their, with their hands. They're hitting him with pool noodles. And then all of a sudden, he sends a receiver off the line of scrimmage to run out and run a route real time. And he has to get in a position to complete the pass. He has to complete the pass. He's got to pass it off. He got to he's got to complete the pass. He he's got to complete the pass. He's got to pass the word. He, listen, you've got to be able to pass the word that God placed with inside of you, even when all of this. Listen, God didn't promise us that we wouldn't have all of this. He just promised us that he would be with us when we had all of this. Yeah, hold on a second. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. So so in in Psalms chapter 23 it talks about this overflow thing. David writes, he says, for the Lord is our shepherd, I, uh, I, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside of quiet waters. He restoreth my soul. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear because his rod and his staff, they comfort me. He prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. <laughs> he anoints my head with oil and he causes my cup to overflow. And then he says something. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. In other words, that overflowing cup's going to saturate it. What'd you, what'd you say, Johnny? You said the, the drip's going to follow you. All about the drip, baby. Uh, Holy Spirit, come on by. But you know what? We miss these opportunities. We, we miss these opportunities. You know what? We miss these opportunities over here. You know why? Because sometimes we're, we're, we're more fascinated with scrolling and posting than we are with the opportunity. And then we make these blanket overflowing statements, you know, that, are, that don't line up with God's word. Like when somebody aggravates you, you want to talk about it. When some, something gone, has gone wrong, you want to talk about it. You want to talk about them, they. You want to talk about that thing. But what if God is using that thing or, or, or they in order to build something in you or for you to build something in them? But you see, you know what we want to do, Matt? We, what, what we want to do is instead, we, 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 want to, we want to call them a piece of sandpaper. <laughs> Y'all thought I was going somewhere. We want to call them a piece of sandpaper. That place, is just, they're harsh. But what if God is using them, that piece of sandpaper, as a place to smooth something out in your life or for you to smooth something out in their life? Peter and John have been freed from prison. They should have, could have easily said, whoa, nope, let's go, John. We're rolling out this place. I mean, we ain't going over there. But instead, no, we've got to obey God, not man. And they, they're standing in front of the persecutors. They're standing in front. Listen. Here, here, is, here is Peter and John 
They could have said, we're not going back, but yet their faith is, is selfless rather than selfish. Can, can I tell you something? You can never, ever, ever experience the overflow of God in your life if you're so selfish in your faith. You know why? Because you'll get into the valley of the shadow of death and you'll think God is not with you and therefore you will forget that he is with you and that he is able and now your faith will be about you and you'll be satisfied with just being full. The problem is your fullness is not going to get you out of the jam that you're in. You see, we can learn something, if you will. We can learn something from, 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 from Peter. We can learn something from John in this situation because Peter was like, you know what? I'm going to get into the overflow. I'm, I'm going to get into the place where God is not just filling me up, but I'm, I'm overflowing on all of those around me because I need for people to see who it is that is working in me. So I want to get to the place where God is beginning to not only fill me up, but he's beginning to saturate the environment around me. I want to get into the place to where God is doing something so great that no one could deny that God is with me and for me. You see, some of you right now are asking why, but God is saying, trust in me. Some of you are asking when, but God is saying, just believe. Some of you are asking how, but God is saying, get ready because I'm about to pour you out. You see, you can't stop talking. I can't stop talking about about what it is God's going to do in my life. I can't stop talking about his love. I can't stop talking about his grace. I can't stop talking about his mercy. I can't stop talking about his goodness. I can somebody get up on your feet and help me because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I can't stop talking and I overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of my testimony. Somebody needs to help me up in this place. Good Lord have mercy. Give him praise come on don't get hung up in the valley of the shadow of death when God wants surely goodness and mercy to follow you around everywhere somebody say I can't stop talking about it a mess the drip the overflow the overflow I need you to realize this is not for you you can consume it I was going to say, or you can speak.